Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I wish I were actually in sunny Australia in the morning instead of freezing Boston at night. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about some recent research that's been going on in my lab. We call our lab the Arts and Mind Lab. So there have really been two prongs of my research program, and I'm going to be talking about the second one here. The first prong, I've spent many years of my life studying the impact of arts education. I call it the transfer question. What kinds of effects does arts education have on children, and does it transfer over into other domains? Um, and I'm happy to talk about that in the question period if people would like to. But um, I am chose today to talk about something new. In the last couple of years, my lab has moved towards um, investigating philosophical questions experimentally, philosophical questions about art. And we ask these questions of non-arts experts, um, ordinary college students who don't know much about art, as well as children. We're really interested in conceptual questions about the arts and how people respond to those questions. And I'm going to give you <clears throat> four of them and talk about each one and tell you something about how we've studied them. The first one is whether aesthetic judgments are like moral judgments. How similar are they? After all, we talk about them both as um, we, talk, we use the term good for both. A good work of art, a good moral action. So the question is, how similar are these kinds of judgments? The second question is, can we keep our evaluation of a work of art separate from our beliefs about the artist's moral character? Or does the artist's moral character, what we know about it, seep in and unconsciously lower, our, lower or elevate our evaluation of the work of art? Third, why should our evaluation of a work of art change if we learn it was a forgery? After all, it's still the same work. What, what is it that makes us like it less? And fourth, could we tell the difference between works by famous abstract expressionists and works by children if we didn't have the labels? Um, all but one of these studies has been done with adults. The um, final one has been done, that I mentioned, has been done with children. But our goal is to run them all with children after we've run them with adults and to look at the differences between how adults and children respond. And one of our ultimate goals is to, to, to develop a set of aesthetic philosophy questions for children to think about in connection with the artwork that they themselves make. So starting with the first question, are aesthetic judgments like moral ones? Let me tell you how we, the kind of very strange way in which we experimentally investigated this. We call it the bitter taste study. And we modeled our study after a study that was done on morality. Um, and what um, was done in this study, in the, in the original study on morality, let me just skip to the next slide. Um, what was done was that students were given moral scenarios and they were asked to make judgments at the end of each scenario about, they read the scenarios, and they were asked to make judgments about how wrong the behavior was that was described in the scenario. And the students, as they were reading these scenarios, were either given a bitter drink to sip, and it had a rather disgusting taste that was not only bitter but disgusting, um, or a sweet drink, or a neutral drink, water. And the question was, does the taste in one's mouth unconsciously seep over and render a moral judgment harsher than it would be if one had a neutral taste? Does the bitter taste unconsciously make the moral judgments harsher? And this study was carried out by Eskin at, and, some, and her colleagues in 2011. And she found that, yes, when people are sipping a drink, which they report later tasted disgusting, they make harsher moral evaluations of people's behavior. When they are sipping something that is either sweet or neutral, their judgments are less harsh. There was no difference between sweet and neutral. So this study suggested that moral judgments are kind of like intuitive like-dislike responses. Like, I like this drink. I don't like this taste. 
and that seeps over into, I like this behavior, I don't like this behavior. And some philosophers have argued that that's just what moral judgments are, they're like-dislike responses. And some have also argued that that's what aesthetic judgments are, just immediate gut responses of how much we like something. So we decided to adapt this methodology to the study of responses to art. We did three studies, and each one was asking whether making aesthetic judgments become, uh, whether, whether a, can, when you look at this screen, do you see something in front of my slide? That, oh, oh, okay, sorry. I was afraid that you saw what I saw, in which case you couldn't see the slide right. So um, we carried out three separate studies, and all of them were asking whether a disgusting taste in the mouth renders our aesthetic judgments more negative, as it does for moral judgments. So we used Eskin's procedure. People read, um, in, remember in her story, they read, they read a story about a moral violation, but in ours, just skip to the next slide, we had them view artworks. And these are three sample artworks we used in study one. One group of students looked at these artworks while sipping a bitter drink, which was later reported to be disgusting, and one group looked at them while sipping a sweet drink and the third while sipping water. And they were asked two questions. How good is this work of art and how much do you like it? In that order. And they rated their responses on a seven point scale. These graphs show that we found absolutely no effect at all. Look at the liking graph. The light blue is the neutral drink. The blue drink the blue bar is the sweet one, and the green one, which was supposed to be lower, significantly lower, um, because they were drinking the bitter drink, is no lower. Those tiny little differences are not statistically significant. So on liking, there was no effect at all of the taste in the mouth. And on goodness, there was no, like, no differences either. So we thought, hmm, is this enough to, to prove that um, aesthetic responses are different from moral responses, or should we pursue this further? Did we do something wrong in getting no effect? So we tried another study. Um, we decided to make this more parallel to Eskin's study, because in Eskin's study they asked, um, how wrong were these actions? And we thought we should then ask, well, how bad is this painting or how ugly is this painting to try to make it a negative judgment, just like the moral judgments were asked. And so we used works of art that we thought people would respond negatively to. And I saw that Howard mentioned something about Komar and Melamed's least wanted paintings. And we used these in our study. And we also added a moral task to see if we could replicate Eskin. So the students had to do two things. They had to respond to artworks, and they had to respond to moral scenarios. And in each case, they were divided up into either drinking something that was disgusting while they were making these judgments or drinking something that was neutral. We skipped the sweet, since there was no difference between sweet and neutral. So these were three of the paintings that we use. These are from Komar and Melamed's least desired paintings from all over the world. Um, and we asked, how ugly is this? And people had a 14-point scale, ranging from not at all to extremely. And how bad is it, ranging from not at all to extremely? And we also read them, or they read, but we presented them with uh, moral stories of two different kinds. One, uh, one kind is called a harm story, and the other is called a purity violation. So here's a sample harm story. You are a new employee at a skydiving company customers looking to buy one of the store's parachutes. You consult with your manager first. You sell the customer one of the parachutes. He plans to try it out tomorrow. The chute failed in-house quality control and should have been tossed. Based on what the manager said, you definitely realized the chute was faulty. So that's very clearly an intentional harm story and they had to judge how morally wrong it was. And then there were also a purity violation stories because Moral psychologists have argued that there are, um, are two different kinds of moral violations, harm and purity. And we thought that perhaps purity violations would be more affected by the bitter drink condition. I realize this part is not about art, but this was all to compare it to how they responded to the art. 
So here's a sample purity violation story. You're eating lunch at a new fast food restaurant. You decide to try the new super burger on the menu. You're starving by the time the burger is in your hands. You scarf down the whole burger along with your soda and fries. The burger actually contains the tail of a tiny dead mouse that got cooked into your burger. You saw a tiny mouse tail halfway through your meal but continued eating. How morally wrong is that? Some people might not think it's morally wrong at all, but most people think that's somewhat morally wrong. Okay, so here's what we found. The, let's just look at the third pair of bars. That is for the harm stories. And the green bar is for the bitter taste condition. And that is significantly higher than the blue bar. So we're replicating Eskin that feeling disgusted makes you give harsher moral evaluations. Look over on the far right to the pair of bars, and that's the purity violations. And again, there's a significant difference, and it's actually a larger difference. Um, so when you have a disgusting taste in your mouth, you unconsciously make harsher moral judgments, both to purity violations and to harm violations. But now look over at the two on the left, the ugliness bars and the badness bars, and there is no difference at all between the people who were sipping the neutral drink and people who were sipping the disgusting drink. So study two shows, again, no effect on aesthetic judgments, and we replicate the Eskin finding. One final study, still trying to get this effect, we said, well, maybe we need to use disturbing art that kind of is a little bit like moral violations, things that are upsetting. And we picked art that was we had them rated by, by people as being not at all pleasant and quite disturbing. And here are three examples. We, we call them negatively valenced artworks. And we thought maybe the disgusting taste in the mouth would have an effect on aesthetic judgments of these kinds of works. But again, you can see we found absolutely nothing. The first pair of bars is disturbing this. How disturbing did you find? these works of art. Yes, they found them disturbing, but there was no difference between the neutral and the bitter. And if you looked at how much they liked them and how much how good they were, no difference, no effect. So after three studies, we concluded moral judgments are actually quite different from aesthetic judgments. Exposure to irrelevant negative stimulus like a bitter taste makes our moral judgments harsher but does not have any such effect on aesthetic judgments. So we concluded that we misattribute our own feelings of disgust to the moral behavior of other people, but we don't do that to our response to art. And so these results speak against the view that moral and aesthetic judgments originate from um, there's a typo there, from, a, from the same kind of mental capacity. And that's been something that's been disputed by philosophers. And so we think that our results, if philosophers are willing to list, look at empirical evidence like this, our results might speak to that, um, to that problem that philosophers have wrestled with. Okay, moving on to the second conceptual question. Um, but it also has something to do with morality. We wanted to know whether people could keep their evaluations of a work of art separate from their beliefs about the artist's moral character. And if you think about it, there are a lot of artists who are very famous and considered very great, and at some po point we found out that they had some rather reprehensible views. So I didn't know this until recently, but apparently the French sculptor Auguste Rodin was, um, had very... Um, anti-Dreyfus views during the Dreyfus affair. So it was very, very anti-Semitic. Ezra Pound was known to be a fascist during World War II, sympathized with uh, Mussolini. Um, Wagner, the composer, has, had, um, has, is known to have written anti-Semitic texts. Um, Woody Allen has behaved, has, has been accused of sexual abuse of his stepdaughter. Um, a paper was written about this with respect to the golfer Tiger Woods. The question was asked, can people, when 
after people found out that Tiger Woods was a bad husband and cheated on his wife, did it make people think that he was less good golfer? And not surprisingly, no, it did not. And the article concluded that we had we do something called moral decoupling. We can say he's a great golfer, but a bad person. And we wanted to know whether art was different. Is art different from athletics in this? And I thought it might be different because athletics is a function of the body, but art is a product of the mind. And so I thought that perhaps artworks known to be by somebody that had some kind of tainted views might seem more tainted. So that was the question we asked. But it's not very easy to ask this question because you can't just say, okay, this work of art is by a really bad person. How bad do you think the work of art is? Because it's kind of leading the witness. It's something that people might figure out the, what you're trying to get at and just kind of comply with you, kind of a, a response demand. There are, this is again a question that has been debated by philosophers. Um, there's a, a position called the aestheticist position that argues that the moral content of a work should be completely separal, separable from its aesthetic merit. And Kant, for example, argued that. And then in contrast to that, there's the ethicist position, which argues that art that conveys more, a morally defective perspective is lower in quality than art that conveys a morally uplifting perspective, and that we cannot fully respond to artworks that we feel are immoral. That was put forth by a philosopher, Carroll. Now, we weren't actually looking at artworks that were immoral. We were looking at artworks that we told people were produced by immoral artists, so it wasn't exactly the same. So here's how we did this. We tried to make it subtle so that people couldn't figure out what our hypothesis was. We gave people a painting to look at and we gave them a biography of the artist. And embedded in this biography was something about the artist's moral character, but we did, tried not to make it too salient. So I'm not gonna read this whole long story, but this is one of the biographies. And in red, you can see that for the immoral story, we embedded, from a distance, he witnessed the rise of the Nazi party. He found himself moved by the words of Hitler and became a fervent anti-Semite and Nazi sympathizer. And for the neutral version of that story, it said, from a distance, he witnessed the rise of the surrealist art movement. He found himself influenced by the works of surrealist painter Salvador Dali and joined the surrealist movement. And later on, there was another little a reminder of his immorality. He kept his anti-Semitism and Nazi loyalty a secret, and in the neutral version, he left his interest in surrealism behind. But this is embedded in lots of other facts, so that we didn't want to make it completely obvious what we were after. And so half the people saw images with a negative biography, and half saw the images with a neutral biography. And here are two of the images we use. And then we simply asked them, Two questions. How much do you like this painting? And how good a work of art is this painting? Now I can't see you, so, and I don't think I can hear you, so I can't ask you what you would predict. But you can think about to yourself what you would predict. Would it make a difference to you? And of course, people didn't know that this was what we were after, so we were really trying to get at whether it would make an unconscious difference to them, and whether their ratings of these paintings would be lower if they were attached to some kind of immoral character. And the immorality that we used was always some kind of hate, belonging to some kind of hate group. Because I saw that as very different from a, a personal failing, like not being kind to your spouse. I was really more interested in political views that are hateful, that we really deem as, as almost unacceptable, to see if that would affect our ratings of the works of art. So um, here you can see some results. Let's just look at the first two bars, the liking bars. I know they don't look very different, but they are significantly different. The immoral artist is the red bar, and it's lower than the blue bar. So there was a slight but significant effect on liking. People liked the works of art less 
when they were paired with the immoral biography. So the morality of the artist's character seeped over into the judgment of liking. But if you look at quality, how good is the work of art, you see no difference at all. So people are really making a difference between how they respond to how much do you like it and how good is it. And I think what's going on is that the moral contagion of the art of the artist's character is somehow affect, infecting how much they like it. But they're able to step back and make a more objective judgment about quality and not have that be affected. This idea of moral contagion has been talked a lot about, uh, a lot, uh, talked about a lot in psychology. Um, people ask people whether they'd be willing to wear a shirt that was owned by a criminal or that was worn by a murderer, and people cringe at the very idea. And on the other opposite end of the spectrum, people will spend a fortune to purchase a golf ball that was owned by John F. Kennedy. So celebrity contagion or immoral contagion um, seems to be a real phenomenon. And I think what's going on is that the moral character of the artist is somehow contagious and is seeping into people's judgments of how much they like a work of art. So our findings for how good the work is seem to be consistent with the aestheticist position that the morality and the aesthetics are separable and independent and decoupled. But the findings for liking seem to be consistent with the ethicist position that you can't completely separate the morality from the aesthetics. One thing we want to do now and next is to look at what happens when we form our opinion of the art first and then hear about the moral transgression of the artist, because that's really the way it happens in life. The way we set it up in this experiment was we we read them the biography and then we showed them the painting. But what normally happens is you learn to love a work of art and then you discover something very disturbing about the artist. Does that change your opinion of the art? Or once it's set, does it not change? And we want to do this with children too. And the prediction there is that they would have less of an ability to decouple. And therefore, that the, the moral character of the artist should affect liking as well as quality but we haven't done that yet, so those are just guesses. A third question we've been interested in is the question of forgery. Why is it that our evaluation of a work of art changes if we learn it was a forgery? Because after all, it's still the exact same work. Some of you, many of you, have probably heard of the famous forger Hans von Mirgeren. Um, he painted Vermeers very well. And this is a Vermeer painted by Hans von Meergeren in 1936 through 7. And it was widely praised by critics of the day. Here's a quote from Radius, a major critic of the day, who said, this is the masterpiece of Johannes Vermeer of Delft. In no other picture by the great master of Delft do we find such sentiment, such a profound understanding of the Bible story. However, later it was discovered to be a forgery. And then all of a sudden people decided that the painting was really no good at all. And they even saw the faces as ridiculously sentimental. And the woman in the background, some people thought looked like Greta Garbo and thought that he had copied it off some kind of image of, a movie, of, her, of this movie star. And it, the painting was just made fun of. So the very same image that people thought was great, now they actually saw it differently once they knew it was a forgery. There are really two philosophical poles about the problem of forgery. There's the formalist position, which argues that if you know that a work of art is forged, that should have no effect at all on your aesthetic experience of it. Any effect that it has is completely irrational and is just a function of snobbery. It should not have any influence. It may, but it shouldn't. And Arthur Kessler is famous for having laid out this position. And then there's the contextualist position, I think best laid out by Dennis Dutton, who wrote a wonderful book called The Art Instinct, 
although it's a little bit too evolutionary psychology-ish for my taste, but I think it's still a wonderful book. And he said <coughs> that when we experience a work of art, we're not just looking at the end product. We're paying attention to the process by which it was made. We're thinking about how it was made. And that becomes part of our response to the work of art. So if we know that a work of art was just a copy, that changes how we experience it. The end product is not all. Knowledge of the process is fundamental to our experience of a work of art. There have been some studies done before our study um, on forgery, but those studies have always asked about the market value of a work of art. So for example, it was a study by Paul Bloom and his student, George Newman. Paul Bloom is a very good developmental psychologist at Yale. And he showed people an original copy, an original work of art and a copy. He simply showed them two images that were identical. And he said, this one here on the left is the original and over here, this one is, the is, the, is a copy. And he asked people to judge how much they would pay for the original and how much they would pay for the copy. And, he, in order, and, and lo and behold, they were willing to pay less for the copy, which is not surprising since the art market pays less for, that won't pay much at all for a copy um, and will only value originals. Um, to show that this was specific to art, he asked people the same questions about an artifact, for example, a car. And he found that whether a car was the original car made uh, of a certain kind or copies of that car manufactured afterwards made no difference at all. It only worked for art. And so he concluded that non-perceptible properties, knowing whether something is the original or the copy, will affect the market value of a work of art. Probably because it's important that you know that the maker was original, that it was made by somebody with an original mind and touched by the hands of the person with an original mind. But notice that he asked about the market value. And we were interested not in the market value, but in the aesthetic value. Because in the case of the Hans von Mirgeren, of course the market value went down when they found out it was a forgery. But the aesthetic value went down too. People thought it was no longer as great a work of art. So here's how we set up this study. And this one we ran with children as well as adults. We asked whether um, <clears throat> the same decrement in response to a copy would occur if we were asking people about the aesthetic value. So we showed people two identical images. These are two Monets. I mean, it's one Monet shown twice. And we had an elaborate story developed about how the one on the left was made by an artist who was really good at making art, and he made this painting. And then somebody else turned out to be really great at copying, and he loved that work of art so much that he sat down in front of it at the museum and made a perfect copy. And then we said, see, you can't see the difference. It's just a perfect copy. That's how good he was at copying. And we didn't say anything about forgery. We didn't make this anything deceptive, immoral, illegal, or sneaky. It was just a copy. And we looked at four and five year olds, six and seven year olds and adults. And we said simply, how good a work of art is each painting? We had them rate each one on a seven point scale. So you can think to yourself how you would respond. You know that one is an original and you know that one is a copy. On the other hand, unlike in the, in the normal case of in real life, uh, where you have one image that you first believe is an original and then find out as a copy. Here we have made it maybe more extreme, more obvious um, that there's no difference between the original and the copy because we show them together and then we have them look at these two identical images and ask which one, how good is each one. So the blue bars show you the original, the values of the, for the original, and the red, the values for the copy. And you can see that in each case, the blue bars are higher than the red bars, which means that even when you put two images side by side that are identical, people think the original is a better work of art. Four and five-year-olds are not significant, the two bars are not significantly different, but they're in the same direction. 
as the older people. For the six to seven year olds and the adults, that's a significantly higher bar, the blue bar. But if we don't, if we forget about the ratings and if we just say how many people gave them equal ratings, how many people gave one higher, how many people gave the other higher, we actually get a different picture. The red bars are the number of people that said they were equal in aesthetic value. And you can see that for four to five year olds, that's the modal response. And for adults, most adults are saying there's, they're equal. So if we just go back to the slide there, the, why is the blue bar higher? It's because the ones that are saying they're not equal are giving really high scores to the original. But if you just forget about the ratings and just say, are people rating the original higher, the copy higher, or both the same, you get this, and that shows that for six to seven year olds, they're rating the original higher, but for the younger kids and the adults, they're rating them the same. So this kind of confuses things. And if you want to, we step back and say, well, who wins here? Is it the contextualists or the formalists? Which, which point of view, which philosophical position did we support? It's not clear, because if you look at the overall ratings, the contextualists are winning. It makes a difference if you know that it's by forger, or if it makes a difference, we didn't use the word forgery, excuse me, it makes a difference if you know that it's an original. But if you look at simply which one was valued more versus less, many responded equally, and that's a win for the formalists. So we, need, we have some more work to do on this, tease this apart and we actually have just um, completed a new study on forgery. We tried to tease apart what aspects of a forgery make it less good. One possibility is it, what, what's less good about a forgery is just that it was made after the original. Just that it came later. That seems like it wouldn't be true, but we included this as a possible hypothesis. The second question, the second possibility is that it matters just because it wasn't made by the hand of the artist. And the third possibility is it matters because it's immoral, it's a criminal act. So to get at the first, the first factor, does it matter just because it was made after the original was made? We compared people's responses to an original and an exact duplicate made by the artist himself. So the only difference was one came first, one came later. To get it, whether it mattered that it wasn't made by the hand of the artist, we compared a duplicate made by the artist versus the assistant. Nothing about forgery or immorality was mentioned. It was just a duplicate made by the artist or the assistant. To get it, whether it mattered because it's immoral or illegal or criminal or deceptive, we compared legal versus illegal duplicates. And we asked people, uh, well, we gave people, well, there were four different conditions. We had the artist making a duplicate. We had the artist's assistant making a duplicate. We had a forger, two different kinds of forgery. We were using photographs, photography, and we had the forger steal the photograph file from the artist's studio and then print the file. Or we had a more um, skillful kind of forgery where the forger steals the idea. The forger goes to the same place that the photograph was taken and waits, till, waits, wait, waits until the light is exactly the same and the shadows are exactly the same and then takes the picture and it comes out identically. And we asked people a range of questions. If you look along the bottom of this graph, you can see the questions we asked. Beauty, how beautiful is this? How much do you like it? How good is it? How skillful is it? How much influence do you think it has? How much creativity do you think it has? How much value do you think it has? And how much originality? And this slide here compares a painting and its duplicate made by either the artist or the assistant. So. The closer the line, the closer the dots are to four, the closer, the, the less difference there is between a duplicate and an original. So if 
because what the, so if you look at the first two dots where I have the red circle, that's beauty and liking, and they're almost up to four. And what that shows you is that people are not really devaluing a duplicate in terms of its beauty or its liking. It's pretty much like the original. They start to devalue the duplicate for other questions. You go all the way to the right and you find origin you see originality, the duplicate is much less valued in terms of originality than the original, which is not surprising. Um, if you go up that scale and look at influence, you see that the duplicate has less influence than the original. I'm calling all of these things over on the right world factors, and I'm calling beauty and liking more like image factors. In image factors, properties of the image themselves are not really affected by whether or not it's a copy. But the world factors are influenced. How original it is, how, how much you, we value it, how creative we see it, how much influence we think it has, and even how much skill we think it has. And it's interesting here that this, these are duplicates. The blue line is the duplicate made by the artist. And even when the artist makes a duplicate right after he makes the original, the value goes down, which supports that original hypothesis that we thought would never hold up, that just because it came second, it's considered less good. It's even worse if it's made by the assistant, and that's the green line. But what's really striking to me is that even when the artist makes, it, make, makes the du duplicate himself, we value it less. We value it, we think it's less good in many ways than we do, than we, than we think of the very first work that the artist made, except for beauty and liking, and that does not seem to be effective. This kind of complicated graph um, compare, it helps us get at whether or not the immorality of the act of forgery is what's making us devalue forgery. Again, beauty and liking are up there showing that they're unaffected by the fact that we have a forgery. The, um, the, the purple line, I'm trying to see this on my slide, the purple line at the bottom is a forgery line. That is the forgery, the forger who um, stole the, 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 the photography file and went and created it. I can see it, it's okay. And the yellow line is the other forgery line, the forger who went and stole the idea by going to the same place and photographing the scene. And except for the one place where the yellow line goes up, which is skill, and I think it takes a lot, sh that shows that it takes a lot of skill to steal an idea in this way. But for getting that one blip up, you can see that the yellow and the purple line are pretty close to the green line, and the green line is the artist's duplicate. So what that's telling me is that the duplicate by the artist goes down just the same as the copy by the forger, which means that, I mean, I would have expected the purple line to be lower. I would have expected the, um, the valuing of the work when it was no, when you know that it was made by a forger who intended to deceive, that would make it worse. And what's really amazing here is that it doesn't. It's just the act of duplicating the work. People want the first work of art. They don't want the duplicates. So this is a study that's just hot off the press and we haven't fully analyze the results, but this is what we seem to be finding, which is surprising to us. Okay, moving on to um, my last philosophical question that we've been testing out on people. Um, and this is actually the first one that I, the first set of studies that I did in this line of work. We asked whether we could tell the difference between, whether people without any training in art can tell the difference between works by famous abstract expressionists and works by children that look kind of like works by abstract expression. If we don't tell them which one is the one that's in a museum and worth a lot of money. You've all had the experience, I'm sure, of having people go to an art museum and say, look at this, my kid could have done this. Well, we wanted to know whether, in fact, people see more than they think they see. 
here are two images that we used in our study. And you can think to yourself, which one is by the child, and which one is by the famous abstract expressionist? And the answer is, one on the left is by the adult, one on the right is by the child. Um, I had a wonderful graduate student, Angelina Holly Dolan, who created 30 pairs like this, where she kept the color and the medium and the compositions as constant as she could, so that they looked as similar as possible, except that one was by a child and one was by a famous artist. Here are a few more. That's the same one. I'll show you a few more in a second. Um, she created 30 pairs, and people saw them either this way with no label, or they saw them with the correct label. So it would say child on the left and artist on the right. We didn't give the name of the artist. Or, and this is where we got kind of tricky, we showed them the wrong label. So in this case, it would say artist on the left and child on the right, deliberately deceiving people the way social psychologists do. You know, I'm a developmental psychologist. And we looked at art students and non-art students. And later I'm going to tell you that we also did this with ch young children. Uh, you don't have to look at that. Here are a few more pairs. I'm giving you the answer. You can think what your guess would be. There you have it. Maybe you're getting them all right. You're trained in art. This one is, I think, a dead giveaway because of the sharp line on the left. So we showed them these pairs, and the first 10 pairs were always unlabeled. The next 20 pairs were mixed up. So some of them were correctly labeled, and some of them were falsely labeled. And we asked them which one they liked more and why. And then we asked them <clears throat> which one they thought was a better work of art and why. And everybody got a score of, each response got a score of one if they preferred or thought better, thought was better the work by the artist. So the interesting thing is that every, every group, the, art, the artist group and the non-artist group and every group of responses, the, the responses for the unlabeled, correctly labeled, and wrongly labeled were all significantly above chance correct. So I'm going to show you the graphs. That is the art students' responses in the no label condition. And the black horizontal bar shows you where they would be at chance because they have a 50-50 choice because there are only two items in a pair. Which one do they like better? That's significantly above chance. This one is the non-artists. They're a little bit less preferring of the artist, but they are still significantly above chance. And these are the artists who are judging, who are making the judgment of which one is the better work of art, again above chance. And these are the non-artists. No difference from the artists. They're able to say which one is better. That's the no label. Okay, now I'm going to show you the correct label. and. Of course, it's not at all surprising that people are above chance on the correct label because they're probably influenced by the label. So here we have the artists for which one they like more, the non-artists from which ones for which ones they liked more, the artists judging which one is better, and the non-artists judging which one is better. You see, the non-artists are more affected by the label, and the artists are more willing to say, well, you may say that's by an artist, but I still like the one. I still think the one by the child is better. That's why it's not 100%. The non-artists seem to be more affected by the label. But everybody's above chance. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Let's look at what happens when people have the wrong label. If people are just influenced by the label, they would the, the ones that are labeled child they were also labeled, sometimes, they, the ones are labeled child or animal. I forgot to tell you that some of these were by chimps and elephants. So we labeled them either child, animal, or artist. Um, you would expect the ones labeled child, animal to be the lowest. So 
Here's what we found. The, uh, that's the artist's preference for the artist's work. So that shows that they're preferring the artist significantly above chance in the wrong label. Don't forget that now you realize that means they are preferring the ones that are labeled child animal significantly above chance. They're ignoring the label and looking at the content of the work. These are the non artists, the artists in terms of how good it is, and the non artists in terms of how good it is. So, the important thing to take away here is that everybody's above chance, and when you reverse the labels, doesn't matter. People don't go for the label. They're responding pretty much in the same way, whether the label is wrong, whether it's correct, whether there's no label at all. So then we decided to do some replications of this to see if this would really, would really hold up. We used the same image pairs, but this time, instead of saying, which one do you like more or which one do you think is better? We just ask them directly, which one is by the famous artist rather than by the child or the animal? And here you can see that they um, are again significantly above chance. The chance line is the uh, horizontal line at 15 because there were um, 30 pairs. And so responding a chance would have given them given you a score of 15. They are significantly above chance. Second replication, we decided maybe we'd made it too easy by putting the images in pairs. Maybe we should show the images one at a time. We thought we were making it hard by pairing up the images so they looked so similar, but actually we realized we probably made it easy because it made the differences jump out. So this time we presented the same pictures, but we randomly jumbled them all up and presented them one at a time. 60 images, and we said, decide for each one whether it was made by a famous artist or a child or animal. And we found that people were significantly, people were able, we used a, a statistics called a, a D prime score, and we tested that against zero, but that's not, I don't need to go into the mathematics of that. What you need to know is that they were able to select the to correctly identify the ones that were by the artists and uh, tease them apart from the ones that were by the children and animals. So, so they were, did that significantly above chance. So even when they're presented one by one, people can do this test. But then we said, well, what's really going on? What's making them? What are they seeing in the images that is making them do this? And so we gave, we decided we paired up with a, an art historian at Boston College who's a specialist in abstract expressionism, and we came up with um, some rating scales. We asked people to look at a, a separate set of people, and we asked them to look at each image again and to rate them according to the following dimensions. Intentionality. We said, rate, rate how much you agree with this question. As I interact with this painting, I start to see the artist's intentionality. It looks like it was composed very intentionally. Structure. As I interact with this painting, I start to see a structure emerging. Negative space. As I interact with this painting, I begin to notice that the negative space is as important as the positive space. Metaphorical meaning. And this scale consisted of two different subscales. So <clears throat> we were looking at, excuse me, <coughs> tension or balance. So. As I interact with this painting, I can grasp the metaphorical meaning. The painting conveys tension and opposition. They rated that. And then, as I interact with this painting, I can grasp the metaphorical meaning. The painting conveys balance and e equilibrium. And the extent, <clears throat> some of the paintings were more, uh, paintings that would be much more likely to get a rating of high tension and some high balance. And so, anytime people strongly agreed with either one or two, they got it, they were, that was counted as giving a high score for metaphorical meaning. <coughs> Communication. <coughs> as I interact with this painting, I feel that it's communicating with me. Inspiration. As I interact with this painting, I feel inspired and elevated. Okay, so these were all attempts to see if we could figure out what it was that was making people able to see that a work was by 
an adult artist and not a child or an animal. So what we found is that only two of these ratings differentiated the artist paintings <clears throat> from the child animal paintings. And those were intentionality and structure, which are the first two pairs. Those are the only two that are significantly different. The blue bars are for the artist paintings. The red bars are for the child paintings. And so what that shows is that people were seeing more intentionality and more structure in the artist paintings than the child animal paintings. None of the other characteristics differentiated the child animal painting. This was for all of the participants. Then we did the analysis again just for the participants who had said they had knew nothing about abstract expressionism. And we got the same findings, intentionality and structure. Then we said, well, why aren't we getting, we're not getting 100% here. Some of the, they're making mistakes on, in, in study, in these earlier ratings studies, they're, they're making mistakes in which ones they think are by the artist and which ones are by the child. They're above chance, but they're not 100%. They're like in the high 60s. So we looked at the works by artists that we called easy and the ones we looked at that we called and the ones that we called hard. The easy ones are the ones that people almost always got right. The hard ones are the ones that people misclassified as by children or animals. And we did the same thing with the child animal works. The easy ones are the ones people could easily see were ch by children. And the hard ones were the ones that they misclassified as by adult artists. And we asked, what is distinguishing the easy from the hard? Here um, you can see <coughs> um, over on the left an easy artist. And when I, mean, when I say easy artist, what I mean is people were very good at saying that this painting by Sam Francis was by an adult famous artist and not a child animal. But below you can see a hard one, and that's one of the ones I showed you earlier, by Hans Hoffmann. People made mistakes on this one. Over on the right, an easy child one, people got this one right most of the time, and a hard child one down below. That one was often misattributed to adult artists. So then we asked, well, maybe if it's an easy artist, people see a lot of intentionality and structure in it. And maybe if it's a hard child and it's misinterpreted as an adult artist work, people also see a lot of intentionality and structure in it. So that's pretty much what we try to test. These, this, these, two, these two hypotheses, that easy artist paintings should receive higher ratings than hard artist paintings on intentionality and structure, and that hard child animal paintings should receive higher ratings than easy child animal paintings on intentionality and structure. And I think it'll be clearer when I just show you the bars. Um, intentionality and structure are on the left. And what, let's just look at intentionality. Um, the red bar is the easy artist. There's, that means that the artists, the works by artists that people are getting right all the time and are saying by artists, those are the ones that are perceived as having the highest intentionality. The hard ones, the hard artists, the blue bar, lowest intentionality. And then if we look at the purple one, those are the easy child animal ones, low intentionality, because they're seen as by children or animals. And the hard non-artist ones, the ones by children and animals that they're confusing with artists, high intentionality. And you see the same pattern with the structure, but not for any of the others. So what that is saying is that people are using intentionality and structure to make these discriminations. And when they make mistakes, they're using intentionality and structure as well. one. The final question we asked is, let's not ask, let's not worry about whether somebody's correct or not. Let's just say if we take all of the images that are rated as by, that are most commonly rated as by an artist, whether it's correct or not, what, which one of these rating scales predicts the likelihood of it being classified as by an artist? And what we found is that only one factor predicted rating some, classifying something as by an artist, and that was intentionality. If you think a work 
as high intentionality, looks like it's planned and thought out, you're going to think it's by an artist and not a child animal. Even if you're wrong, it's intentionality that is guiding your judgments. Intentionality is key. So we are reading intentionality into these works. So we're concluding that people who know nothing at all about abstract expressionism and may well be among those people who are standing in front of these paintings at a museum of modern art and saying, this is a scam, this is a hoax, my kid could have done that, that even those people discern intentionality and structure in these works. They're seeing a lot more than they think they see when they're looking at abstract art. I think these findings tell us something about the nature of non-figurative art, and they also tell us something about the fact that we just can't stop ferreting out intentionality. There's just a real desire to see intentionality, and if it's there, we're going to pick it up. We did three further extensions of these studies, and I'm not going to go into any detail because I know it's getting late. I just want to say that we did a study using eye tracking, and we put people in front of an eye tracker and gave them both um, pairs, both instance, both images in a pair to look at, and we gave them a series of these pairs, and we found that when we asked people to think about which one they think is a better work of art, they look longer, and they have spend more time visually exploring the artist's works than the child animal works, and they also show larger pupil dilation, which is a measure of interest as well as effort. And we gave this study to children four to seven-year-olds and eight to ten-year-olds, and even the four-year-olds could distinguish the works by the abstract expressionists and the works by the children and animals. The only difference between the children and the adults is children actually <clears throat> preferred and judged as better the works by the children and the animals. And they said really funny things like, that's really good for an elephant, so I'm going to say that's one, that one is better. And finally, we teamed up with a computer scientist who actually called us up out of the blue and said, I'm a computer scientist. I program computers to distinguish um, styles of art, and I'd like to see whether uh, my computer program could distinguish adult works of art from child and animal works of art. And yes, it did. And in the, in the computer was at about the same percent correct as humans, at about 68 percent correct. So there's clearly something in the works that the computer, that the children, that the pupils, and that the people who know nothing about abstract expressionism are seeing, even if they don't know they're seeing it. So this, these, this series of studies shows that we know more than we think we know. People who think there's no difference between abstract expressionist paintings and paintings by children actually are seeing a lot more and there is a difference, and they're seeing more than they think they're seeing. So, sum up, what I've talked about is studies on whether aesthetic judgments are like moral ones, and that was our series of bitter taste studies, and to the extent to which, if, if the way, if the proper way to ask that question is to ask whether a disgusting taste in the mouth has the same effect on aesthetic judgments as it has on moral judgments? The answer is no. I'm sure there are many other ways to approach this question, but in terms of that specific instantiation, no. The answer is no. We could, we, they seem to behave very differently. Can we keep our evaluation of a work of art separate from our beliefs about the artist's moral character? Well, sort of but it wasn't a very strong or clear-cut response, so we still need to pursue that. Why should our evaluation of a work change if we learn it was a forgery? It's still the same work? Well, it doesn't seem to change for beauty and liking, but for other things that I'm calling world factors, like influence and creativity and impact and value, it does. And it seems to, ha it seems to we seem to devalue forgeries not because they're immoral, not because they're illegal, but because they're duplicates. They're not the first work of art. And also they're not made by the hand of the artist. But the immorality seemed to have no effect at all, which surprised me no end. Finally, can we tell the difference between works by famous abstract expressionists and works by children without knowing which one is which? The answer is a resounding yes, we can. And we do it by ferreting out intentionality.
and structure, but intentionality seems to be the key factor. I'll just leave you with <clears throat> a few questions that we're now pursuing in our lab. We're developing studies on when children are willing to call something an artwork or a picture rather than just naming what it represents. We're trying to figure out how to study what kind of a concept art is for adults and for children, how closed versus open is the concept for them. And finally, we're trying to do with visual art what people have done with music, where people have had people listen to music and, and rate over time the emotions they're feeling. We're trying to study the emotional reactions people have as they're looking at an abstract work over time. And we're trying to compare the strengths of these emotions to the kind of powerful emotions people report when responding to music. I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. And so I'm going to end here, and I'm very happy to take questions.